lunch. Um, we have uh, two sessions if you enjoy this afternoon in this room. Uh, and we we'll have any questions. Okay. All right, hello everyone. My name is Virginia Clinton LaSalle, and I'm from the University of North Dakota, which I'll show you where exactly that is in a moment. And I'm here today to share the research findings from an in classroom study I did on student motivation for the landscape. I didn't mean to uh, make that rhyme, so I changed the title on to Social Annotation What are Student Perceptions and how does social annotation I'd like to bring? All right, first I want to explain part of the reason I'm so excited to be here. I work in that red rectangle in the map here in the United States, and as you probably guess from the location, it gets quite cold. Um, and right now I am missing the biggest blizzard of our winter, which we already have, record snowfall. So you see that red arrow? That is the direction the storm is moving, and my house is right there. <laughs> I have my stepson on call to take his young, limber, 20-year-old self out to help my, dig out my 70-year-old mother, who is watching my children who are over to school. And that's my friend's cat watching the snowfall. And like the rest of us, when we get spring, we'll ever come. Anyway. Also a little bit more about me, I uh, am a primary researcher with the Open Education Group, and I manage a research fellowship. Uh, we're a group of early career re researchers from a variety of disciplines and backgrounds are supported through collaboration and mentorship uh, <laughs> and some financial help for things like attending the Open Education Conference in the United States. Uh, to research and promote research in open educational research resources, and now we've developed more into open pedagogy as the field has more. That's a picture of us on Zoom. There's no actual tiger. All right. Uh, so my talk is going to be about open pedagogy and, or also known as OER enabled pedagogy, but basically things you can do because we have open license that you can't do so easily. Or not at all with closed license. Before I talk about open pedagogy, I want to talk about our roots in emancipatory pedagogies. These are pedagogies developed by scholars such as those listed there about how to transform and redefine how we look at education. Historically, education has been a tool to make <coughs> uh, racial and class hierarchies, especially in the United States. So what can we do in order to transform those knowledge structures to upend things through collaboration, through student empowerment, through student knowledge and ownership? And one way that this can be done that's quite simple and straightforward, in my opinion, is through social annotation. Uh, let's pause to take a drink there before I run through all my slides. And so what I mean by social annotation is there's a shared document or resource I used an OER textbook, you can use audio, video, what have you. And students take notes on that resource. And unlike typical note taking, students see each other's notes. They're allowed to comment on them and they can upvote their their peers' notes. And upvoting would be similar to liking or forwarding something on social media. The tool I used for social annotation is perusal. And the reason why I use perusal is because that happens to be what my institution supports. Perusal works beautifully with open educational resources because the licensing is flexible. You do you are able to post and have students share and comment as much as you'd like. Um, there are other tools for social annotation. Uh, if you went to Kate Malloy's talk, she talked about hypothesis earlier. Hypothesis is a well-known tool in open education. Uh, I've heard it works very well. A benefit of hypothesis is you can actually have the comments be public. Um, in fact, some journals such as through the American Psychological Association and MBPI, you can actually comment 
online publicly for others to see on their articles posted. So a future study of mine is to have my educational psychology students comment publicly um, that way. So I have students, uh, this is not my class, this is a screenshot that I found uh, from somebody else's class where I didn't have to show students' names because I didn't get their permission to do so. So what do we know about social annotation? It is an area where there has been research. So we know social annotation is a way that students can interact. They're on a shared document or a shared resource. They're seeing each other's comments. Uh, in terms of asynchronous, you know, engage anytime, anywhere. This works fairly smoothly. There's a synchronous chat option if you want them doing it simultaneously. And it does help with peer interaction. And um, it's <laughs> mostly examined in online courses because this is a tool for online interaction. Um, there's more work that's shown in peer 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 interactions in general. It allows for what's known as shared meaning making, which means students can share their experiences and knowledge as it relates to the text, which then helps their peers better understand because they see these shared experiences. Uh, students can also ask questions, and then peers or the instructor can answer them. And it's also been shown as a helpful method for encouraging students to prepare for face-to-face -face classes. Yet we all know that students are notorious for not doing the assigned reading before class, and unless we have some way to hold them accountable for that reading. Oftentimes that accountability tool is a quiz or a reflection paper. This seems to be a good method as well. Looking at the emissions, uh, students reported that social annotation means that they had more happy, positive, pleasant emotions and fewer unpleasant negative emotions compared to individual note taking. Uh, also, we know that social annotation has the potential to empower students. This is a way where students can engage in talking back to the text. So rather than having the text be this perfect source of knowledge that dropped from above, that they are just meant to take it in like a vessel, they can speak back to it. You can encourage students to challenge it. This is an opportunity to encourage um, a way of dismantling those power structures. And also, this is more focused on my specific area of research, but it might help with overcoming what's known as screen inferiority. So I did a study um, which may be very famous in the traditional education community as far as like academics go. So I found that paper led to better comprehension than screens and meta-analysis, a lot of very traditional face-to-face uh, -face educators uh, we're very excited about that. I'm like, no, 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 that wasn't my point. I wanted to show, like, okay, we have this problem with screens, but screens are here, so how can we work with them? Uh, other people took it as throw out your Kindle, get paper books. Not my point. Um, I had a lot of people very surprised that I'm actually very pro educational technology. I'm the opposite of that. Anyway, I did a follow up study pointing out all the electronic tools such as interactive questions, video links, feedback, and social annotation as a tool you can only use with an electronic text. And I found that that really helps with comprehending the text in general. So uh, this idea of screen inferiority is that if students are reading from screen, which students very rarely will actually get a paper copy unless if they have to. Uh, this is a way that can really help them improve their comprehension. So that's what we know. What do we need to know? What do we need to do? 
Everything is a theoretical lens. This is something that's very much beaten into me when I went to spread with students is what is your foundation? How are you connecting this to the roots of prior literature? Now, it gets tricky when you're trying to do something transformative and knowledge producing and, you know, change things because changing things, there isn't always a great theoretical framework to go off of. However, a lot of social annotation research, including a study I've done um, a few years ago, lacked a theoretical lens. It was more of a, okay, let's look at how this works and let's see where some correlations are, but without a real grounding in theory. Another issue is socialism. There's a great paper by Brown and Croft about how uh, social annotation is a wonderful opportunity for that transformative knowledge producing by students. And we really need some data to back that up. Where's the research uh, to align with that in order for, to have the theoretical and the empirical inform each other? Face-to-face -face modality. We've done a lot of wonderful work in the online world, but you know we still have some face-to-face -face students. So how do we engage them, especially if we are expecting them to use these educational technology tools? And then grades. Uh, there's a study that was done by Adam and colleagues, and they found that students who were assigned to a group that did perusal before class or social annotation before class did better on the exam than students who were not, but it was, um, they weren't sure, was it the social annotation that helped them learn, or was it that the social annotation got them to read the book and to think about the book and to process the information and relate it to themselves? So what what exactly is the, uh, what we call in, you know, my nerdy world, what's the mechanism going on here? So I wanted to peer into that a bit. So my framework is self-determination theory. It's a theory of motivation where humans have these basic psychological needs, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. We have optimal motivation when our needs are met. If these needs are not met, it is harder for us to be motivated, especially intrinsically motivated, that is to do something for its own good. My thinking in this study was that with social annotation, we definitely have high levels of relatedness, especially thinking of things like quizzes and individual note taking. Probably a good amount of autonomy compared to quizzes because students would get to choose what they commented on, where a quiz is given to them and they have to know X, Y, and Z. For competence, I wasn't so sure about. Are students going to be really nervous about this? Are they going to feel confident? How's this going to go? And then a social justice framework. Uh, Sarah Lambert has a very nice article going over these three components of justice. And just by the virtue of open licensing, we automatically get redistributive license justice with OER because those materials are more accessible without the financial barrier of an access cost. There's still Wi Fi costs, internet costs, there's still costs. But they don't have to pay to log on. We're cognitive because of editing. We're able to change things in an openly licensed textbook. So that can allow for better cognitive justice where people can see themselves <coughs> in the materials. But where open pedagogy really has a lot of potential power is representational justice. And this is where students are allowed to have some power and authority. They get to speak back to the text. You get to flatten power structures. And this also gives an opportunity for communities who have been historically underserved in education to speak from their voice and their experience. So representational justice is something I consider in this study. So here's my research question. I compared it to quizzes and individual note-taking because quizzes are commonly used as a method of accountability in reading before class. Uh, individual note-taking is an obvious comparison to social annotation. 
Uh, and then I was also inquiring as to what's the received representational justice. And then as far as how this matters with grades, I looked at associations. So basic correlations and then a little bit fancier mediation model I'll talk about later on. So in my study, I used my face-to-face -face child development course. This is mostly first and second year students, mostly teacher education students, um, mostly female, mostly white. So it is not the most diverse sample, and I want to begin with that caveat. Uh, however, this is material that is brand new to them. Uh, they're usually it's fall semester, right at the beginning of their college group. And they were required to write annotations at each chapter before we covered that chapter in class in groups of five to six students. So they only saw the comments from their peers in their groups. Uh, after after they were done submitting all of those, I went through and you can filter and only see the questions, which I recommend because 45 students times six comments, for 50, it's a lot. So I would only view the questions and go through and answer the questions and you can tag them so they get a notification that you answer them. Uh, then I asked you to do a survey and they were very nice and almost all of them good. Uh, with the motivation. I use analytics from the proposal software itself. It gives you a wealth of information. So how much time did they spend reading? How much time was they actively reading? How many annotations they made? How long were each annotation? Uh, I looked at a few key features I'll talk about later. And then their course grade minus the credit they got for each social annotation assignments. I didn't want to predict grades that social annotation uh, with <clears throat> social annotation. And just to clarify, very low stakes assessment. The directions were make six comments of voting your peers and comments of replying to your peers is encouraged. And you had to have them completed by a certain date. If they did it, they got full credit. If they didn't do it, they got less credit. So the, I didn't dig into the quality of their responses or anything. This was a very low stakes assignment. You can make it much stricter and much more um, of a qualitative approach. So first question, what were their motivation levels? So with autonomy, having those feelings of independence, if you look at choice and pressure, uh, you can see that Choice with social annotation was definitely more than quizzes, but less than individual note taking, which makes sense. Social annotation is required, rarely are students required to turn in notes on their reading. Uh, but they definitely felt less pressure compared to a quiz, and both a quiz and social annotations are required. Uh, competence, they felt more competent than a quiz, but about the same as individual note taking. So that feeling of skill, can I do this? It's approximately the same. Relatedness was higher with quizzes and individual note taking. I just like was really, I'm like, how much relatedness do you really feel with individual note taking? And then interest enjoyment, you can see it's about the same with the two note taking. Uh, <laughs> some comments they had about what was interesting or enjoyable um, let me look over but mostly it was things I liked getting to see what my peers had to say and I liked being able to share what I experienced with the book to be able to share that with my peers next question was on representational justice so this was asked in a um, instrument that I developed with my colleague Lindsay uh, Here's some examples of items in the representational instrument we developed. And on its scale of one to five, um, I only looked at social annotation because I could not think of how to phrase these for quizzes and individual note taking and not have it just be really weird. Like, my voice matters in a quiz. Why would it matter in a quiz? So, what I did instead was I compared that to the midpoint. 
and found that it is uh, significantly higher than midpoint. So that's not awesome, 3.87, but it's better than average. In other words, we could do, there are ways this could definitely be developed. There's a research question. What about some correlations and associations? So the measure of grades in the course correlated with how much active reading they did. That meant they didn't just have it open, that they were moving their mouse and clicking and page scrolling. Uh, the number of annotations, average words for annotation, the feelings of competence matter, and their feelings of relatedness. So there weren't any reliable associations with those other measures social education. Uh, I did what's called a mediation analysis, and I found that the more annotations the students did, the more they read actively, and that explained why their grades improved. So it seemed like this really helped motivate them to read and understand the chapter and spend more time with the material. And they're also reading their peers talk. <coughs> so discussion and conclusions, overall, there's clearly more motivation for social annotation than quizzes. Like that is a clear take home. But it's pretty mixed with individual thinking. Oh, it's more related, we call the same competence, but uh, less pressure. Somewhat promising representational justice findings. I'm not doing backflips over that finding by any means, but it's it's a it's a tiny step in the right direction towards this kind of inquiry we really need to be doing. So this is one itty bitty data point that I'm hoping is going to be part of a larger trickle and stream and river study. And Social annotation affords collaboration and course materials. It, it encourages students to interact with each other and the text and interact with each other about the course content in a way that's meaningful to them and important. So my future directions, I'm going to be using this to flag areas to edit the open textbook. The OER we use is excellent, but I did realize going through it with my students <laughs> that a lot of their comments, I was like, oh, that could be worded better, or that could be stated better. And I'm also, so their upcoming assignment, this is my sabbatical project, is to develop it. They're going to be flagging areas that purposely need to be improved, which then the next cohort of students will then use the information to improve the text. So my grand adventure, hopefully I'll be back in a couple of years to share all about how it was at least somewhat successful. I am going to do a controlled experiment comparing social annotation with individual note taking. The learning management system allows you to randomize groups and hide the and hide the directions for they can only see the information for the group they're in. So one group is only going to see instructions to individually take notes and they're going to be required to upload their notes. The other group is going to be socially annotated on perusal. It's an online course. The odds that they're going to know, pretty slim. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, my colleague Allison and I are doing that this summer. Uh, this I'm also going to be doing comparing social annotation to quizzes. So uh, be able to see how, which one's better for learning in the course. And we really need a deeper examination into social justice, particularly with more diverse student groups. My institution is a predominantly white institution. I'm not proud of that, but that is the sad reality of the matter. You really need to be looking at this with students who aren't <coughs> the ones who have been traditionally well served. So uh, that is a big area. Okay, that's my correlation matrix. Is anybody asked? Acknowledgements? And then here is my contact and resources. I'm on TikTok until it goes down. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, and then this is my guide to renewable resources that covers social annotations as well as a variety of other ideas. And then that's my materials and data. So, 
Thank you very much. Yeah, about three minutes or so. Questions? No, I love what you're doing. It's fantastic. Uh, very inspiring. Have you thought that a further step in student empowerment would be to move from annotating into uh, uh, repurposing, recreating, republishing? Because annotation is more or less like glossing in the Middle Ages, putting notes on the side. But what about incorporating? Yeah, and that's why I want to do the um, have them flag the areas, to edit the textbook, and then have those flagged areas be used to actually improve the. What about them, the students? Oh, they'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, they're doing the, the flagging and then they're gonna help find the materials to improve it. Yeah, but not them publishing their own. They'll be, I'll be, yeah, they'll be listed as authors. Okay. So they will be publishing it. Like I said, hopefully this will be moderately successful at least. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, have you ever looked at annotations that are not text? But either voice or video? I have not personally looked at that. So, mm -hmm. bias admitted here, I am a reading comprehension researcher. I like words. <laughs> but yes, that is something I have, I have thought about is there's things like voice thread and it, where you can do audio replies or video replies. Perusal's setup is text only. So, that is why I use that. Yes. Thank you, Virginia. It's wonderful. Your work is wonderful. Um, Thank you. The number of annotations, does that, is that a, um, a predictor of the active reading time or a factor? Yes, it was a, it was a strong predictor of active reading time. Sorry, okay. I kind of rushed through but that if, mediation if you, model. If you're teaching people and you're, you're getting them to put in annotations, is that helping them develop their active reading time or is it just a kind of, um, is it an artifact of, I'm an active reader, when I'm reading a text, I'm Which one comes responding first? to it in my mind, or? Well, I mean, it could be that they're reading more, so then they post more. And, and I was surprised students were posting more than they had to regularly. That's great, sir. Yes, yes. So, and I found that with open pedagogy in general, with Wikipedia editing, my students were giving me way more than required. That is not a normally a problem I have. Yeah. yeah. Really good presentation. Thank um, you. So one question I have is, I, I work with a lot of faculty who are interested in social annotation in general. Mm -hmm. um, so we commonly use hypothesis. Yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. One hypothesis, but one recurring problem that faculty reference with social annotation is doing at scale. I'm just curious, how does per user manage that aspect of like, managing and grading? Is oh, yeah, the grade book doesn't actually work. Results. So thankfully, I I mean, I have 45 students and it's a very like you did it or you didn't do it. So it only took me a minute or two to click through and enter the grades manually. So, but there is a perusal grade book that if I wanted to set up requirements, I could do that. Like if I wanted to say your grade depends on reading this many pages and opening it this many times, but yeah, I just haven't done that. And then I'm sorry, there's another person coming up. Yeah, we've got literally a minute. So, um, uh, it was a quick question. Yeah, I just wanted to know, and that's your talk. So, I mean, how are you going to navigate the ethics around the students taking part in the social annotation versus individual notification? Do they be aware that they're taking part in the experiment? Yes, they get a informed consent document that they'll be in a research study. And um, if yeah. they do not want their data used, they let me know. So, yes. Excellent question. You should always consult your institution about ethics with you. Thank you, Virginia, once again. Thank you. So much. So there's a bitly um, uh, link at the bottom. So sorry I didn't use a QR code. Um, I actually locked my laptop due to my son changing the password right before I left. 
So I have to get back to Canada before I can get energy my lap. So give me a second. Give me bit.ly. Um, and it's going to be so I'm going to talk a bit about um, some research that we've been working on at the University of Calgary, just to talk a bit about Virginia. So Virginia pointed out that she was in the middle of that blizzard. If you go 10 hours north of that blizzard, <laughs> that's where I live. <laughs> but we don't have a blizzard. We have beautiful weather, and I'm not sure, you know, the world is the way it is. So I'm just checking as people are going on. I'll come back to this at the end to be it. Um, in Canada, it's really important to acknowledge the traditional territories in which we come. So uh, the traditional territories between seven region is of southern Alberta, whereas the University of Calgary is located, even though I'm, I'm from University or I'm from Edmonton, which is Prealta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising of the Sikha, the Kami, the Nai First Nations, as well as the Tsukina, First Nation, and Stony Dakota, including the Janiki Bears Kawasi First Nations. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation, Alberta region number three. And this is um, when we talk about the land in which we come from in Canada, we, we think about why we appreciate the land as well. And in this case, this research all stemmed from my dissertation research. And I was that um, naive, I would say, um, successful recipient of my dissertation or completion of my dissertation research. And part of it is we get to go to the dean of our university, the dean of education, and have a little meeting with her. And we talk about what our research was about, which I think is lovely. Um, but I went to talk to her about open education, and she said, that's nice, dear. <coughs> Basically, she might not have said dear, but that's how I felt. <laughs> but that's your thing. Like, this doesn't exist in the rest of the world. And um, I was shocked. Not only because I went into it knowing about open education around the world, but she then compared it to her study on uh, classroom uniforms. And I thought, wow, like you really, really don't get it. So it was that first moment of really in research, thinking I, you know, had changed the world and had really done nothing. And my, even though my dissertation was open and creatively common licensed. No, it didn't mean anything. So I went outside, and this is how it connects back to the land. And I looked out to the mountains and had a good cry and said, I'll fix her. <laughs> so what I did was there's a scholarship of teaching and learning um, opportunity on our campus where you can apply for about a $2,000 grant. And the people that I did change, and I did make a difference for my supervisor and my supervisory committee. And Together with my supervisor, my supervisory committee and students, and some of my classes, so some undergraduate students and some graduate students, I suggested that the course that I was teaching, um, I knew that it was in this, which I'm going to talk about in a second, this uh, graduate course, a uh, certificate program called uh, Leading and Learning in a Digital Age. I said, I'm going to work with my students and we're going to design and create our own press book or textbook for our graduate course. And they said, don't know what you're talking about, but fantastic. Sounds good. We'll support you. So that was what I went in with for my uh, dissertation research, which I had my own framework, theoretical framework. I knew you know, where we were going, but we used the dissertation research in order to support the solo research. So uh, Dr. Michelle Jacobson, the senior homemade, you know, was my supervisor. Dr. Barb Brown was on my supervisory committee. Christy Hurl was one of the librarians. Um, we don't have an open librarian necessarily at our university. The university is about 35,000 students. We have undergraduates, we have graduate students, we have large. Um, in Edmonton, I work at Concordia University, also important because I do work for them. <laughs> and, um, they're the reason I'm here this week as well. And there are only 3,000 students. Ooh, Mia Charles Hayward was one of my undergraduate students. And the cool news like was in one of the classes we'll be talking about. So leading and learning in a digital age is um, part of our master's of education in the interdisciplinary learning programs. You start off and you can get a graduate certificate by taking four courses, and they're specialized courses. Um, and the goal is that they all build upon one another. But you could just get a graduate certificate for taking it. And they call this part of the micro credential program, some of our interdisciplinary programs, so just kind of giving you an overview. Or if you take eight courses, you get the graduate diploma. 
often um, my students will take like design design focused emphasis for their second specialization topic, or they might take neuroscience or like with the um, ed site kind of focus or you know all over. So they don't necessarily <laughs> connect between the two. That, but there is, I would say, some discrepancy and room for improvement on some interdisciplinary uh, learning between those two. Then to get to their master's in education program, they take four more required research courses. And this is really important for this study that we're going to talk about because this is the first time that they really have their developed their research skills. So that's where the emphasis would be in the, uh, the third year, I guess you would say. And then if they wanted to do apply for a doctoral degree, they could merge. So. Um, this these slides we use at different conferences, obviously, but to put it in context for everyone here, um, we use the UNESCO definition of open educational resources, and we used the wonderful Kathleen Cronin's definition for <laughs> open educational practices. Although I would suggest that as this research has continued, we've changed which definitions we, we've used for open educational practices. So this research question, um, I kind of have to explain, this wasn't the original research question. The original research question was just, it had to be very focused on OER in order to get the $2,000. So you had to it's, create an idea about OER and it was to what extent do students benefit from co-designing an OER, something like that. But when we did the research, and this is what we're going to get to, we discovered that there was a lot of data that really started to inform and emerge about research skills. So we sent back our ethics after we did our original research, and we came up with this research question, how do open educational practices support the conditions for student learning of research-based skills? So this was done over two years, two different iterations of the course. Um, and it was open-ended, one-on-one interviews. This was all done after the course was over in terms of ethics or any questions about that. It was all voluntary. Um, so it's not anonymous because we obviously knew. I didn't know who said what, but everyone else did because I taught the course. There was a survey with 18 online questions and the artifacts were all the students could decide to share the artifacts or not. There were only uh, 13 participants in the survey of 24, so there was, oh, sorry, 23 possible, um, and the interview participants were eight, and the OER chapter contributions were 15, so 15 total chapters of 23 possible from the students. You always had a choice whether you wanted to share your, your chapter, final chapter with your work. So why DDR? And it's so fascinating yesterday at the GoDN um, day, because when I worked with, or started with GoDN, I was one of the first um, students to consider using design-based research. Is that too rough? I would say, is that fair to say? I'll think of another one. There we go. So we have it here. So yeah. And yesterday there were four in a row that presented. So I was really excited. Now, design-based research is really, it can be really challenging because of the length of time to do the iterations required or the phases. You don't have to do them all for, for dissertation research. That's one great thing about using it. But the good thing about DBR in this case, um, it just innovations and it sustains their development. So you're, you're choosing to use this uh, research approach in order to create or to focus on an intervention or a change. You know there's something wrong, and you want to make a difference from an educational context. It's not confined by the methodology, so the change, the research findings fed back into the cycles. And so I kept changing the design of the course. I we changed the methods that were creating the chapters. We changed all sorts of things as a result of the findings as we went along. So the big difference is that you don't find findings at the end that say this is what I did. You didn't make changes as you go along. Which is the next one, big change happens. Continual improvement, community <laughs> of practice. The uniqueness of this is that the researchers and practitioners work together. So the students in the course knew that I was doing this design based research as we were doing it, but they knew that I wasn't. They always could um, 
they knew that they would have a choice whether they would want to participate or not. So they, they, if they never wanted to say paid at all, that was fine. And none of their data was, was taken, but they would still be a part of the process, which made them think about and model what research could be. Um, it's problem-based and it's theoretically informed, and hopefully it contributes to theoretical insights, but also design principles and changes and changes of pedagogical practice. So getting back to the, the graduate certificate, um, they take a summer interdisciplinary learning and technology course, and their focus is on creating a, or completing a critical article review, and I would definitely suggest the social annotation as an opportunity there. Their fall technological literacies course, their focus is on a literature review, and then they got me, and they take the winter ethics and technology course, and at that point in time, there was no textbook, so it was a great opportunity to create our own textbook anyway. And they created their draft OER manuscript, their chapter. And then in spring, they take a leading citizenry in digital age. And they actually take their idea and figure out how they put it into practice from a leadership perspective. When we were designing this program, we took those initial ideas um, and we compared them to Wilson and O'Reilly's facets of um, development of research skills. So we knew from the original initial design our expectations, like what we expected we would see. So when, when they did this, this is what we hoped we would see. What we didn't anticipate was the increase in skill development as a result of number three, the course number three, when I used both in educational practices. So that was interesting. So this is a very <laughs> brief overview of what we do in the course to give you a design of it. Over the overarching is that the course is full of open tasks, which encourage feedback loops internally within the course and externally. That would mean using social media, social annotation, connecting with experts, asking your significant other to read your paper, things like that. Things just taking that first step on sharing. Um, and we did a lot, a lot of reflective activities, including blogging, a lot of blogging in different ways. So they started, <laughs> these are the things that they were assessed on that built upon each other throughout the course. They have a digital outline, they did a one minute pitch, they did a draft chapter, they received feedback, they presented that draft, and then they decided whether or not they wanted it included in the press book. During this time, the uh, program director also went into their chapters and gave them feedback. We noticed the number one thing that helped us realize there was something going on with the research skill development was our initial feedback that said, I've never received feedback like this. It's really hard for me to handle right now. Just give me a minute. <laughs> um, because they were really specific because we were getting them to that level, that writing level that you'd want for an article or, or something else. But we did it in a very gentle way. We thought, like on a scale of one to ten, but we got a lot of feedback that they weren't used to it because they got feedback almost immediately. Like yeah, as they were going along, they just kept getting more and more feedback and had to learn how to deal with constructive feedback. They were also giving feedback to their peers. Um, and we created social pods which are groups of three to four people of different interests and different perspectives, and they gave each other feedback and, and received feedback. And this was really important because it showed that you could have a totally different topic, but you are still able to academically think about a topic and, and, and think about how something is structured um, as an article or a chapter, but also what theory from the course or from outside the course can support it. I provided the students with a choice in their use of tools and approaches. It did not be tried to like pull it all in and rein it all in and it never worked. And we provided supports and frameworks on, on, across all the tools. For example, tools suggest I would share with them how to use Twitter. This is a template for how you can write it to your chapter. Um, and I modeled for providing constructive data. <laughs> so we have two versions of the Pressbook. We have the first year version and the second year version. Um, and on the PowerPoint, you can get the links to this, so you can understand more. And these are some of the participant responses in that initial, that initial research, like 
92% of the survey participants agreed that connection to outside experts in class enhanced their learning. Um, participant engagement and formative feedback loops beyond the duration of the course. Specifically, what that meant is when you had a hashtag, they kept going after the course. It's like the course that never ended reflected how they had heightened commitment to ensure that their original aim for each topic of interest was synthesized. Because if you chose to complete um, an actual publication of a chapter, as we all know, it doesn't happen overnight, it took another year for it to actually be published, each one took a year, their commitment outside the course continued in that they kept talking about it, they kept engaging with each other. The integration of Twitter and publicly accessible blogs made the learning open to the world and therefore more authentic. Um, the hashtag and the ability to determine the subject of the chapter created an internal motivation. I don't think I've ever seen internal motivation written by my students talking about how they were excited about being internally motivated and, and um, enthusiastic about learning. This motivation, in their opinion, was not my opinion, I still know them, would not exist, would not be strong if the subject or chapter was assigned by the instructor. So everyone obviously got to choose their own topics as long as they could connect it to ethics and technology. Um, and then the other points were cohorts and peer feedback strongly supported my learning. I didn't feel alone in my learning. I felt like I was part of a team and I, I felt like I was collaborating, I was, part, I was with others. And 90% of the participants completed the survey agreed with the authenticity of the assignments um, connected either to professional or personal interest and increased their learning and engagement. So then what we did was we went to, we coded the data and we used three different frameworks to support us. So at this point, we took the facets of research-based skills that we used to design the course. And then we also compared it, or used the attributes of open pedagogy from Tiger T and the six dimensions of connected learning curriculum framework, which some of you might remember from UCL, from their connected learning um, project. We compared and contrasted them, and these are our major findings, our themes that emerged. The layered assignments, the formative feedback, and the peer learning proved to be the major conditions, specific things that we do in open educational practices that led to the increase and development of their research skills. So offering renewable assignments to students to develop ideas as progressed in each course. So the idea that the work that they were putting in, they'd be able to use later and would be thrown out. Um, they provided accountability through continually needing to find information. Um, their learning never stopped. They could connect with peers in their own course or outside the course. We learn to critically evaluate these are also specific skills themselves and others and organize their inf information synthesize, synthesizing data, for example. And in peer learning, specifically because we use the social pods, they were able to embark on inquiries with peers with diverse perspectives and experiences. And they helped each other find, analyze, and synthesize the needed information. We got them to blog as we went through, as I said, and they had to answer each other's blogs, reply to each other's blogs. So obviously they were learning from and with each other as they were going through, through the steps of creating and writing the chapter. So they were able to see that everyone goes through the same thing. And um, <laughs> the issues that you go through writing a large paper like this. But the other most important one is that formative feedback which they received from their peer groups, instructors, outside experts, lots of outside experts, and this helped them find information. Um, there were always some negatives. Some found the feedback overwhelming. Um, so that meant that there was too much feedback. Again, I don't think I've ever had that comment, that there's too much feedback in this course. And the, uh, the primary reason was because they were getting feedback from fellow students, as well as outside experts, as well as myself. Um, so they just needed time to think about that feedback and, and figure out what they were going to do. Um, and the other one, nope, that was really the, the negative, sorry, the thing to work on the challenge. So when we think about it, the condition one, most important is design of layered assignments for authentic learning and engagement. Specifically, we encourage them to think about authentic tasks, or sorry, the integrated authentic tasks and learning experiences. That's what we do in open educational practices, like having a Twitter chat, which we won't probably 
do anymore, but we would think about it, doing it differently with some other social media tool while teaching them how to do it, I think is the important part. We intentionally went into this thinking about the programming course design and made sure that there was scaffolding between the courses as well as the program itself. We looked at ongoing and constructive formative feedback, the connection to experts, internal and external feedback, peer learning. Um, we ensured that there was support and check-ins and timelines. So I didn't let the students just go off and do it all by themselves. I made sure that there were specific timelines and check-ins at the peer or social group, peer groups or social pods. And these are some things to think about if you want to do something like this. You need to have a coherent program and course learning design, and the students need to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. That includes learning outcomes, infrastructure. You need to have access to textbooks um, or whatever the open source tool that you're using via your institution or region. Sometimes it's a great idea that you might have, but you don't have access like, <laughs> to pretend that's the one that my institution uses. Figure out what you have, what software. This was a team commitment. I think I learned that more than ever. Um, as a dissertation student, I thought I could do everything by myself, and I thought I did everything by myself, but the reality is research is a community, and it is a, a huge community. So our team had diverse expertise in OEP, pedagogy, co-design, digital authoring tools, copyright, librarian, peer review, copyright editing. It really helped that you had students open to learning and collaborating in new ways. The students who didn't really want to buy into the process felt that they didn't get anything out of this, and then we have others that would never do anything differently. We know how that works. Funding is always helpful, even a little, little bit, <laughs> to keep you motivated, and we noticed that in the second iteration of the course, we didn't have any funding. So thank you, those of you people, and we really like you to read it. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, only one easy question. Well, it's not that easy. But uh, <laughs> this is wonderful because it's a, it has a great vision, but also you have a uh, very much values driven and very well informed. But it also has the granularity. You know, we can tell what you're doing, and it's very, very useful and very practical. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, stages in those processes in which one could use with the students. Uh, chat GPT. Have you considered how to integrate, you know, purposefully chat GPT in any of these stages of the uh, of the collaboration? Yeah, so I'm um, an advocate for AI mostly because I don't know how I'm going to live through the world without accepting it. It's not something I want to fight out of all fight on my mountain die on. Um, in those original stages where you get them to write their original drafts. I would encourage them to use ChatGPT or an AI tool to start those ideas. I think that you can really be inspired by some of the, that's where I think the best about AI, to start the ideas, to get them going. I know even with my son, who's in high school, we both talked into, or got texted into ChatGPT, the same thing, and his essay was different than mine. And so we came together to look at why a 16-year-old's essay would be different than my age essay. <laughs> um, and the big difference was, the way I asked the questions, how I, I changed it to get what I wanted. And, I, and in that moment, I said to myself, oh, well, that's what I need to focus on. I need to help you shape your questions. I need to, to make those comparisons. And we had a great conversation, and we talked and talked, and then as a result, he had a, a better essay. But we both started with the yeah, essay. So I think it's an easy, easy way to use um, that for chat GPT or whatever. Yeah, yeah I, in my teaching, I invited yeah. Chat GPT as a co learner. Yes. Yeah. So, so oh, like yeah, so I was explaining to the students that it's, it's kind of like a toddler. So, um, you kind of use kids and cues, kind of like, please, could you write something about this rather than that kind of demanding it to. Yeah. to so, it, it, it's like quite, quite a useful yeah, like way to um, utilize it you know, yeah. and talk about the kind of errors, especially. Yes, but it is about the errors because what we're trying to teach is critical thinking. Yeah. Um, they know, well, we've given them the template on how to write the chapter. <laughs> if they're still struggling with that in a master's level, well, that's a different issue, right? That's something that we can help them with and we can support them in different ways. They kind of like the peer, because a peer, that's a great idea. 
The other thing that I didn't mention, sorry, I was going to say that the number one person he actually, so I asked Martin Weller to jump in on all of them. <laughs> the topic was ed tech ethics. And I use Google, obviously, so many of you use computer machines. And Martin would go in and it would say, Martin Weather, Weller says this, you know, how it does the smoke cry. So the, the real point of this is why the expert, the expert kept coming up. All of you are making contributions in different ways. All of you make them cry or in a good way and get excited when they get that feedback. The feedback was the number one thing. Of course, Martin Weller's you know, <laughs> way up here. But all of us make a difference in that little bit of feedback, and this would be appreciated. Okay. Um, I wonder what the rationale was behind uh, having two different versions, number one. Of versions of what? Oh, you had one version for the first course. Oh, it's just, it was just, uh, just course outline? Or the, oh, for the press books. It was just, those, those are the chapters the students wrote. So you didn't want them to be in one together, like building on no, it? No, they, and actually there's a real difference between them. The first, <laughs> the first year version, they didn't have an example or really anything to follow. And I would say that we all learned in it and uh, there was some, the second version is, second version strong because it was recorded. And there's some really great topics because it was also, the first one was when COVID started. And the second one was during COVID. So the second one has like, why you turn your camera on or off, like a full and really good chapters. There's really good chapters in the second one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, and there's ones on AI. Like you can see the progression. And that's kind of neat too that you, as an instructor, I would be able to see the progression of ed tech through these press books that were being created. But then I wasn't hired to teach the third course that last year. So I taught one of the different ones of the four. So, we stopped. <laughs> Questions? I was uh, wondering um, what extent you think this type of approach um, might work at undergraduate level. So, I think, <laughs> I think it's just the, the size of the writing. So, I change it. I use Wikipedia in my undergrad classes a lot more, and it is, it's the same idea. It's just which what you ask them to do, the assignment. Um, I totally agree with the social entity. It's that collaboration. Feedback, feedback, feedback. They think they're contributing, they're building knowledge. They think they're making a difference. Just like I wanted to when I walked out of that dean's office in tears thinking I'd made a difference, but I did, I did. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Some sort of a time now, and next sessions will start at five past three. <laughs> Thank you.